Hey there, this is Jamie from Stonemeyer Games as usual. And today, uh, unusually, I'm not usually joined by someone else, but I have the pleasure of being joined by Sam. Sam, why don't you introduce people and let, you know, let them know why you're here and who you are. Sounds good, Jamie. Uh, okay. So my name is Sam. Uh, I have been in the board game hobby space for close to four years now. Um, I, it really took off sort of when I met my fiance. Um, and so I've been following Jamie for a while now, and I noticed a trend of him just being very open to always willing to give feedback if it was a public setting. So I, uh, on his blog, one day reached out saying, ever since I watched one of your previous public interviews, uh, I'd always wanted to be on the other end of it uh, as somebody that's looking to get into the hobby space um, and try and produce my own games. I would, I would love that conversation. Uh, and I sent him sort of the seven questions I would ask. And that's what brought us here today. So I'd like to thank Jamie up front for allowing me to be part of this platform. And I'm happy to be here today. Well, thank you, Sam. Yeah, and I want to, along the way, during this conversation, I want to hear a little bit more about your journey. Um, you mentioned some fun stuff in an email about how how much you've researched to to get to where you are right now, which I think is great and, and awesome. So we'll incorporate those into the conversation today. Works um, for me. Yeah, where did you want to start out with? Uh, so I think probably the first question I sent you is probably the easiest place to start this conversation. And that was around sort of the question of what is your design philosophy for handling edge cases? And I believe the game I referenced was Tapestry. I think the mechanic of gaining a civilization partway through the game is such a cool uh, mechanic that allows these creative like games to look back on and the storytelling. And it's a cool mechanic that helps fill the narrative, but probably leads to these crazy outcomes um, from just like this tapestry civilization working with this one and just kind of leads to these crazy spiraling effects. And so what is your design, design philosophy when handling something that, like, like that? Yeah, um, I mean, a part of it is what you mentioned there at the end, the, the spiraling effects, the loopholes that, that really clever, experienced gamers can find when they play a game over and over again, or, or maybe when they encounter something for the first time. But a lot of the questions we get that are edge cases are from people who are, are, are looking for them almost. They're looking for those loopholes. They're looking for those ways to turn a five-point turn into a 50-point turn somehow. And I love that, especially I love that about Tapstream in particular and any game that kind of lets you do that. Um, and I lean, as a designer, I lean on, uh, I guess I haven't completely answered that question. I, I like to enable those powerful turns. I want players to have turns where they feel clever and they feel powerful. But I also prefer to eliminate edge cases that, um, and especially in a competitive game, that can ruin the experience for the other players. Um, and that has happened, or the, I would say it's almost happened with Tapestry. It's probably happened with some combinations, but it's almost happened along the way, uh, especially early in the design. And that's where I lean on the Automa solo team, because they are really, really good at finding loopholes and edge cases. A lot of the people on the Automa playtesting team, uh, they look for that. Like they're, they're, they're playing solo, and so they, they don't have to wait for other opponents or, or consider a downtime for other opponents. So they can just stare and look at that board for 30 minutes and tr try to find those loopholes. And so late in the design process, the design and development process, we often get a lot of feedback from the Automa team where they point out all these edge cases and loopholes that we missed. And we try to close them. Like there's a, a tech card in Tapestry where we say that you can only use this ability once per turn. I think it's the lithium ion batteries where you can only do that once per turn. Um, and we've added maybe a few little rules along the way to prevent that from happening. Have you ever, while playing Tapestry or any of our games or any game, have you ever found a loophole that that made you feel clever, but also made you feel like maybe that should have been uh, tucked the, uh, the, the one that comes to mind uh, would be in Tapestry. Mm -hmm. And then, so I, I don't remember the ex exact circumstances of the scenario, but I, I realized early on that uh, the regressing on tracks would mm -hmm. allow to utilize the, I, I think in my head, I was like, I can gain eight or maybe four. Um, different civilizations and then right as the buildup of the turn happened i realized i just misread one of the cards which so it was still confined within the game but the the idea of that possibility of being able to do that was a very exciting feeling for me and yeah. um tapestry is a game that i play with my fiance all the time of it's not really the score that matters but mm -hmm. those moments that it's like oh let's get this out and just see the story that unfolds yeah I, I would say I'm that style of gamer too. And I almost have to, 
because I'm that style of gamer as a designer, I have to try to put myself in the shoes of other types of gamers too. Um, like if I encounter an edge case in a game or a loophole, sometimes I'll just ignore it. Like if, if I think maybe the designer missed something and I, I'm going to create a worse experience with other players as a player, I might ignore that. But there are players who will jump deep into that regardless of the experience of the other players, which is their right to do. But I try to keep an eye on that when I'm designing. I, yeah, I, I can understand that completely. Yeah. Yeah, that's a fun question. That's probably uh, a good lead into um, my follow-up question because I yeah. don't want to ramble on my concept yet. But uh, you've talked about in Red Rising and also Size sort of the inspiration that you've gained from other published games. I believe um, you had said that there was a lot of initial inspiration from Scythe from Terra Mystica and yeah. how Fantasy Realms has been a big in inspiration for Red Rising. Mm -hmm. um, so if you don't mind talking through your process of when you feel comfortable that the game is differentiated enough, either through kind of blind playtesting and feedback that you get through that, or just sort of what your gut tells you when you know is the right time of like, it's not just a reskin of this beautiful game that already exists, but sort of without asking leading questions and things like that, just if you don't mind explaining your process for the audience, that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you asked about that. It's something I think a lot of people, a lot of designers think about, like, am I, am I just copying another game or is it okay to, to use another game's mechanism? And my answer for that definitively is, is yes. I think um, like we don't design in a vacuum. I play a lot of games and I learn a lot from them. And I think those influences can make me a better designer and can hopefully bring joy to other tabletops in a different form if I can innovate with those mechanisms. And that's kind of the, the, the key to what you're asking here. What is the difference between innovation versus just copying and pasting? And for me, the I, I think I think it's a fairly subjective line to, roll, to draw unless you are literally copying and pasting, which has happened incredibly rarely in the history of, in, of game design. Usually people get will get called out on that, um, including even lawsuits. If, if you have plagiarized another game, literally copied and pasted, you, you can get a lawsuit. Um, but the, the way that I draw the line is if I have designed a game, and Red Rising is a good example, because Red Rising is probably the closest game to another game in existence, Red uh, Fantasy Realms, as you mentioned. Um, the question that I have to ask myself is, is the game that I've worked on or that I produced or designed, uh, should it even exist if this other game already exists? Um, and for Red Rising, I think it is a quite a different enough game from Fantasy Realms. Uh, it has the, the, the hand building mechanism, but a lot of the other stuff is very, very different. Um, I think it's a heavier game. It's a longer game than Fantasy Realms, for better or for worse. And so I think it does exist alongside Fantasy Realms. I have both in my collection, obviously, but I think both are, if someone likes that mechanism, I think they can both belong in the collection. So that's the question I asked myself. And I've asked myself a number of times during design process, processes for other games. Like I love the game Sulkin. I love those dials, the wheels of putting the workers on dials and having them age. And I've tried to work with that mechanism, but I've never come up with a game that I think could be as good as, or could potentially replace Sulkin in the collection. So I'm just happy to have a Sulkin in my collection. I don't need to design another Sulkin. Is this something Sometimes that you think okay. about? Yeah. Are, are, are you thinking about this in, in the, in your design process right now? Are you worried about? Copying well, so the question um, sparked in my head. So two weeks ago, we had our local convention um, here in New Hampshire, and uh -huh. I was showing off one of the designs that I've um, been very much putting a lot of energy into. And yeah. I got the, one of the best compliments for me personally, uh, but it also got my, it's, I would, I was told the game feels very Stonemire esque and it was very much um, great to hear because uh -huh. you, you are one of the designers in the space that I very much uh, love the design tenants that you've listed out and I, I resonate with all of them, but it also, the design process started from just my enjoyment with Scythe over the years. Uh, and so it does use that similar action selection mechanic of move to a new space but yeah. over time has the game uh, without taking up too much time is all about collecting these relics for your cart to then upgrade into the action slots to build these like ongoing engines mm -hmm. and has really morphed into the game is more about uh, not having the cards block the bonus actions, which is around, but it still has that linchpin of the mechanic. And so uh -huh. while it was still very, um, appreciated that I, I was if the game was even referenced uh with your publishing company's name it did give me the oh well does it it, it gives you makes you question sort of like what you had said with zolkin of 
can this stand even like within the realm of a like side that's already published? And so I was just curious about your take on that. Yeah, I, I, I think, I mean, from what you've described there, I think it's, it sounds very different. Um, I, I think that, I think it's great for something to take inspiration from a mechanism um, and to run with it and, and to forge your own path there. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So the, the third question I have listed is, uh, so when, when uh, you, you've talked about in your crowdfunding book, um, how you've used Kickstarter for a few other projects before Viticulture, but Viticulture being your first board game that you used crowdfunding to publish. Yeah. Um, sort of the, you talk a lot about building the audience and sort of the, the whole building the crowd starts before the game's finished. Mm -hmm. But what was sort of the, either the gut feeling or indicators that you're receiving from playtesting that gave you the feelings of, okay, this feels like a packaged enough game um, to kind of call it there. Cause I know um, it may have been you that has referenced it or other people in the creative space of that game designers are tweaking the game all the way up until you have to submit it for production, but yeah. where uh, you felt, okay, was it more the audience that was surrounding Viticulture that gave you the indicators to, um, I don't, I don't want to ask too much of a leading question, but what was the yeah. like gut feeling that pushed you into, okay, it's time to um, create the like Kickstarter page for Viticulture? I know you don't oh, use okay. Kickstarter anymore, but um, yeah. sort of the, yeah. I'm rambling at this point. <laughs> <laughs> no, I get, I get the question. I have a couple different answers because Viticulture, like you said, it was my first crowdfunded game. And I honestly, looking back, I don't think the game was ready. I think maybe it was ready for crowdfunding work. In my mind, I thought the game was around 90% complete. Um, it was, a, I would say, a true crowdfunding project in that I was raising money to pay for the art and to pay for the graphic design and things like that. Like I did not have a lot of that in place yet. I had samples in place, but not the, everything there. Um, but I thought at the time the game was ready, and it really wasn't. I hadn't done very much blind playtesting which uh, for anyone watching this who doesn't know what that is, that's when you send the game, the files for the game and the rule book to people who play test the game when you were not there. It's kind of unguided play testing. And I had done very little of that for, for Viticulture. It's something that I learned the value of later because it's a great way to test the rules, a great way to get honest, unbiased feedback about balance and fun and intuition. I hadn't done that for Viticulture. And so um, for Viticulture, I was kind of just going by gut feeling that I, I was having fun with the game, that local groups were having fun with the game. Um, now that I have a full-fledged blind playtesting blind play process for every product, uh, the two signs I look for, I still look for my gut. I still look for if I feel like the game is ready, because part of it is always going to be subjective. There's no scientific formula. But I do use some data points, too, because whenever I do a blind playtest, I ask the playtesters to rate each session on a scale from 1 to 10. And so typically early on in like the first wave of blind playtesting, it's normal for a game to be rated between maybe 6, six to 8. And then by the end of blind play testing, when I'm doing the final wave, I'm looking for scores that are eights, nines, or tens, and pretty much only those scores, maybe a rare seven, but eights, nines, or tens, averaging around 8.5 or nine. Uh, that's what I'm looking for. So I do have that data point that most play testers are really happy with the game that they're playing. And that's a signal to me that the game might be ready at that point. But also the, I, my third answer here is uh, you asked it, like our game designers are always iterating, are they always, uh, you know, tweaking one last thing? And the answer is yes. Like until the last minute that I can um, that I can make usually, usually changes for clarity are the ones that I make at the, at, that I continue to make rather than things that might impact balance or actual gameplay. But yeah, I, I continue to make those decisions up until the last minute that I possibly can in production, just cause I, I want the game to be as perfect as it possibly can be. And once you hit print, you can't change that stuff, at least for the first printing. Yeah. Very understandable. Are you going through that right now in your game? Is your game in a place where you're wondering if it, if it might be ready or not? Uh, so Yes and no. I always uh -huh. feel like after, so I haven't moved completely into blind playtesting um, just in parts because a lot of it's still um, for the, the transparency sake, uh, a lot of starting out designers don't really have that network of blind playtesting that they can lean on and utilize, which is, you know, some of the benefits of like, you know, the effort that you put in the front end to be able to have simpler things like that. But um, I've been doing a lot of playtesting with people that aren't within my network from some of the board game communities that I've joined and sort of, you know, trading play tests and getting feedback like that. And leading up to every play test, I'm like, oh, I feel like the game's 80% of the way there. 
and not so much from like the feedback that I get, but the observation, because one of my um, things that I know about myself is that I'm participating in the play test. The gamer in me is focusing too much on the game. And uh -huh. so I don't really, I'm missing those uh, very important like pieces of feedback like yeah. from watching. So every time I watch, I'm like, oh, we got to go back to the drawing board. Like I got <laughs> I to fix this or do that, or this really works. I need to lean into that is sort of the, where I found myself in the last um, two months, which mm -hmm. is, a, it's more of like the, the core system feels like, I'm really proud that the core system feels right, like right mm -hmm. and solid and like unique of enough game that would um, give it validity to exist in the published space. It's yeah. more just, all right, now that we've, built the framework of the house, how to decorate the rooms was sort of the analogy I'd use. Yeah. And so. Well, um, one thing I, you mentioned that I think is really great, and you mentioned this in your email too, is that before even trying, it sounds like before even trying to trade play tests with other people, that you kind of went into some of these groups and just put yourself out there and said, I'm I'm available to play test for someone else. If I'm, is that, is that, yep. yeah. I think that's awesome. It, I think that's such a generous way to to kind of enter the game design community. And hopefully, have you seen that repaid a little bit? How have you seen that work out? Yeah, so um, sort of my process is when I know um, I have the free time, just mm -hmm. throwing it out there. And sometimes it won't get used because obviously everyone's got different schedules and times won't relink. But every time that I've been available to play test and not like, you know, having everything plastered of, I have a game too, look at my game. It's yeah. very much been like when the feedback comes, um, they, they say thank you and ask if they can do anything in return. And that creates like a perfect opportunity to, you know, create a connection, if nothing else, of just, you know, if you're not ready to play test uh, your own game or like sometimes, like there was, I believe one time um, I had just gone through a big reformatting of uh, the upgrade card, like the relics, because it, it's built around sort of this, uh, not quite I cut you choose, but a decision process with, are you going to use the card for its one-time bonus or are you going to build it for its smaller bonus that can accrue over time? Yeah. And the UI of the, so user interface, sorry, if anyone isn't familiar with UI stands for, of like how the card is set up, mm -hmm. I played 90% of the time virtually. And so uh -huh. because of how Tabletop Simulator is wonky, I designed around that, but the first play test you quickly realize the way to clean up the card like i just had i found a better way to represent the information by reorganizing it and so it wasn't readily available to play on tabletop simulator mm -hmm. after i would made that understanding but still being able to like provide to others is a very important part about what i stand for in the community so sometimes you don't get the trade but it's always good to just be helpful is sort of my philosophy that's I my love that box I'll get off of. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's I think that's awesome. And I hope also all designers who are currently only playtesting on Tabletopia or Tabletop Simulator, I hope they hear what you just said, because I think it's so important. I think it's great that, that we have those tools, but actually playing on the tabletop can yield stuff like that, where you, about the user interface or about like that you've asked players to shuffle 20 decks. And in real life, 20 decks is too many decks to shuffle, but in, on Tabletop Simulator, that's super easy. So you, can, you can't find that stuff until you actually table up. Uh, Play test on the tabletop. Yeah, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I know you've just talked about. Um, so expeditions is coming. Um, you, the pre-order is done live, and people. I, I don't know if people can still order it from your website currently, mm -hmm. but um, it's your newest upcoming game. Um, yeah. Sort of has a card stacking method in it as well for cards that you can remove from your hand and upgrade. Um, was there sort of a transition or memorable moment going from? I don't know if you started virtually or. Uh, on the table, but do you have any of those experiences that you can share um, with now the new age of game design? Uh, yeah. Being... No, I wish I did because I, I I kind of preach this advice, but I don't play test virtually at all. I only play test on the tabletop. So every time I iterated on expeditions, I was here on my, my printer behind me cutting and pasting and, and making a new prototype every single time. So perhaps I'm losing something by not play testing at all in that format, but uh, I don't know. I, I like I like getting my hands dirty on the tabletop. I would say trust your gut. I don't think it's really <laughs> wrong so far. Um, so I a little background to this question for the audience yeah. who doesn't know. Um, I had submitted all of the questions I would like to ask Jamie um, on his blog, but I had since 
we had committed to doing this interview, uh, found that he actually answered this question two years ago with Mike Delisio on the Dice Tower. Um, so I've kind of talked off script with Jamie. So I have two questions to kind of fill its place. But the first one that he answered uh, on the Dice Tower was, I asked what one mechanic that Jamie was very proud of or connected, like had an, either an emotional or like mental connection to in a game that he ended up having to remove by the mm -hmm. time of production because of uh, playtester feedback. I was just curious about like what that experience was. Um, and also, Jamie, I'll, I'll link the, the video I found it on in case those okay. that are interested yeah. in your uh, answer from two years ago to have that yeah. secondary answer as well. But what is one game mechanic from any of your games that you still kind of think about late at night because it, it did <laughs> something that gave you some sort of a, emotional connection to it? Well, I have two different answers for this. And one doesn't quite answer that question, but I think it's it was interesting to me a little bit. Um, in okay. my little game, Smitten, I designed a little two-player cooperative game. Um, and this is the first game that I've designed where uh, the the original versions of it had players taking turns. And in Smitten, you're, you're just, all you're doing on your turn is playing a card and placing it in a grid. And the other player, based on what's on that card, the other player has to do something. And it's a cooperative game. And if that player can't do that thing, both players lose the game. And that was in the original version of the game, players took turns one after the other, because that's kind of the structure that I use in my games. Players take turns, taking turns. Um, but Smitten only really started to work once I was playtesting with Megan, actually, my girlfriend. And I was like, you know, let's let's try that again, but let's not not have a set turn order or turn structure. Like the game became a game of deciding whose turn it is. I, I could say multiple turns in a row if that would help us towards victory, making could take multiple turns. And that worked so well. So that was, it isn't something that I regret giving up because I think it made the game exist um, and made the game work. But it was, it made me definitely think outside of the way that I usually think about games in terms of the turn structure. Um, and the other great. example <laughs> for expeditions. So I went into expeditions wanting it to be, and this is kind of a, uh, uh, maybe a word of caution for myself in the future. I wanted to design a deck building game or a bag building game, um, some sort of building game. And I wanted uh, to use a rondelle in terms of the exploration. And so I went into expeditions wanting it to be a rondelle deck building game. And I tried and tried over many, many iterations of expeditions to try to make it a deck building or bag building game with a rondelle. And neither of them worked. They, they both of the, those core mechanisms made the game worse. Maybe in an alternate universe, there is a version of the game where someone, some alternate version of me figured it out, but I could not figure it out. And so once I broke away from those preconceived notions about what I wanted the game to be, that's when it started working. When I gave up the rondelle, when I gave up the deck building and went with more of the uh, a Concordia hand management system. So I don't know if you've ever experienced that with a game design where you go into it thinking, I want this to be a worker placement game. And you kind of try to force it for a while. And then you realize it's better off being this other thing that I didn't go into it wanting it to be. But that has happened to me many times, especially with expeditions. Uh, for the those that follow your content, so is, was expeditions the one that you've talked about for years of working on a, a quote unquote deck builder? Um, it, yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was intended uh, to be a deck building game, but I, I, uh, it just didn't didn't work that way. Well, maybe there's still one in uh, in the <laughs> queue for in the future, but. Uh, no, it, I, I wouldn't say that I had an experience quite like that um, where I dropped it in mechanic completely, but I liked the idea of um, the, the working title for the game I've been working on is called Everstone um, and sort of side tangent um, of I've been fascinated with allowing theme and um, mechanic to kind of dictate one another. And yeah. so uh, sort of fell into this rabbit hole of trying to create a world around what Everstone is. And so there's a lot of world building, um, totally irrelevant to the question. But was just, um, I had started with really liking the idea of like, you're in this world spreading influence and as you work with and do things for others, like sort of your, your presence is spread out into the board. And so I had, mm -hmm. I liked the idea of, um, like each location had spots that you could place out influence and claim that little reward of. Mm. Uh, but it just, through all the play tests, it was sort of a secondary thought and never really, um, it just never worked. Cause like yeah. the, the, those that were, even when I would play test by myself, it never, um, it never jived with the overall flow of the game. 
And yeah. so I just put it on the back burner because uh, it just, it was preventing the design from really like kind of, you kind of alluded to it, but sometimes the game needs to dictate how the game needs to be played in the design process. And yeah. so it wasn't until um, later on when like, so, so the theme of like, you're collecting these three different raw element resources to restore the relics uh, uses a similar storage system to like the century type, type games where you have a fixed number of spaces to hold the resource. Um, okay. I was getting a lot of feedback of that, you know, there's not enough spaces or there's too many spaces to like hold the resources at a given time. So that's where it, the influence kind of came back in play where it starts where you're limited in the number of spaces you have available to you. But one way to improve your like ability to supply and store the resources on your board is by placing resources, uh, influence tokens, which then uncover an extra space to hold them. And so okay. the playtesting from that ended up um, really starting to flow and people started to understand reasoning for why they'd want to place influences. It, you know, nice. if we're looking back on this interview, uh, it, it may not exist in the game anymore in the future, <laughs> but that's sort of what made it work where uh, it, similar to the uh, like, taking turns multiple times in a row wasn't something I was trying to force into it, but right. it was sort of just something that happened naturally. That's um, awesome. So I, I like that. taking up yeah. more time than I should have on that question. So I appreciate it. Oh, no. The... I think you explained that really well. I, 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 I like that you're letting like the theme impact the mechanisms, but also then paying, paying attention to playtesters and seeing what they're actually using or having fun with and letting that come back into the mechanisms too. That's great. I try to do that as well. Yeah, so I'm, my, my day job is an industrial designer, and I, th I've, mm. I feel like I've always been conditioned to you shouldn't have any sort of emotional attachment to anything that you design because mm -hmm. it oft oftentimes will um, like push a, a direction that probably shouldn't be pushed because uh, yeah. there's that emotional decision behind it. Um, so I, that's sort of one of the ways I try and do everything is to have emotions but try and keep them separate from the decision. <laughs> Um, nice. speaking of emotions, the filler question that I was going to swap that question out with, with Jamie yeah. was, uh, what Stonemeyer game do you believe has caused the most smiles around the table? And why do you think that is? Well, objectively, I think I have to say wingspan because we've sold by far <laughs> the most copies of wingspan. And I think it's, um, it's the type of game that I still, I hear people saying that they, there, there are some couples that play wingspan every night. Like they just leave it on the table. They play it every night and they, they've connected to each other that way. They've connected to their kids, their, their parents. Um, and it's also like Scythe has sold a lot of copies. Scythe is on a lot of tables out there, but Scythe, I don't think has really reached outside of the hobby game space to non-gamers all that much. I hope it's happened. I know, I think it's happened in some cases. It's introduced some people to the hobby, but Wingspan has excelled at doing that. It's brought in a lot of people who wouldn't normally have tried a modern tabletop game into the hobby, whether it's due to the theme or because they heard enough people talk about it. And so just by sheer numbers, I think it has to be Wingspan. But what about you? Which which game, uh, and maybe don't name, don't name the Stillmeyer game, name another game. What's a game from another company that has brought you the most joy, most joy, sorry, and your, uh, your fiance at the tabletop? So walking through the interview questions in my head this morning, I already had uh -huh. my Stonemeyer answers. Oh, okay. um, but uh, I also answered it the same way that I thought you would. I, I think it's hard to ignore that. I think Wingspan, just the sheer uh, outreach that it has had to introduce people into the hobby, uh, yeah. along with the bird facts accompanied with like the flavor text of each card. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you'll need to cut this out, but the third party app Songbird, I don't know oh, yeah. if you're familiar with it um mm -hmm. that's also like being able to like the way my fiance and i will play is when we're looking for kind of just the night to not uh not that wingspan isn't a thinky game but with mm -hmm. some of your heavier weight games and like other ones out there if we're looking to sort of have a relaxing play we'll pull out wingspan and we'll take the songbird app and so like in order to play your card to your um tableau you need to not only say the bird fact but listen to what the bird song is and nice. so it, it it creates a lot of laughs um, uh -huh. just because a lot of the bird sounds are um, cause laughter. <laughs> They're very silly, but uh, I would say off the top of my head for a non Stonemeyer game, mm -hmm. um, it would be hard not to mention uh, Spirit Island. Spirit mm -hmm. Island is one that uh, funny enough, 
didn't have like the great greatest first impression on mm -hmm. uh, us because it's um, it's not an easy game to jump into. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, it was it came into the collection. We had a good win the first play of it, and then the next two plays I think we lost like pretty handedly. Mm -hmm. And so me being not the uh, most graceful in loss uh, <laughs> was like oh like not the game for me but uh, I'm very glad that Michaela was very uh, like not adamant but subtly pushed it back to the table and since then it's like skyrocketed up for like it's the game that will play the two of us and similar to the stories that size and tapestry will have of like when you look back at the game you can um, you had mentioned it in one of your videos talking about games that don't have set narrative but like you can retell a story about it yeah um, the theming around those uh individual spirits as well as some of like the power cards that you get throughout the game create yeah. such like very fun memories to look back on which create the smiles so that would be my unprepped answer for that that's great that's great and two st louis companies there too stonemeyer and uh greater than games <laughs> exactly yeah um so to prep the audience, these last three questions, Jamie doesn't know exactly what I'm asking, but one <laughs> of the things that I'm passionate about is sort of just publicizing sort of the creative thought process of game design as a whole. Um, there, there are a lot of people in the space that talk about um, the, the polished version of the design and the end result, but I'm very fascinated and frankly just love talking about sort of the messy parts where the game doesn't have to, like the idea doesn't have to work, but just the idea yeah. of getting it out there to see um, how you can fail at it is sort of one thing that I very much um, like to put out. And yeah. so the three questions are in regards to game design um, and sort of what Jamie's initial like off the cuff uh, reactions around the brainstorming process would be. So without <laughs> further ado, um, so if you were to add a fifth section of the player board in Scythe, like if you were to create another mm -hmm. whole column, uh, you, you may have started with five. But I don't know the background of that, but what uh -huh. would the top action be along with the potential building? And what would the bottom action be? Um, just kind of initial thoughts about mm. what initial thoughts are triggered and potentially what steps you'd take to try and flesh them out more uh, and to, uh, yeah. for ease of not having to create a whole fifth resource, we can just say that this space is, can be a wild resource to spend. But that okay. may uh, affect the, the theming because uh, size, I feel like, is very heavily like baked in with the theme around it. So that might. Yeah. I, I, I've set up the question. Let's just hear what you have for a response. Yeah, that's an interesting question. In a way, the game answers that question a little bit because you can play, a, you can have a factory card that becomes yep. the fifth section. And so I like that that's a variable. Um, but if it was a set pre printed section and you could fit it in the box, um, I'll tie it actually into a, a small regret that I have for Scythe, which is that I think a confusing thing for new players is how the worker, how you gain workers and how they're related to the stuff that they're covering up on the board. Because workers on the player mat are connected to the produce action and you gain workers or resources by producing. And so that can, it can just lead to a little bit of confusion. I created a confusing mechanism there that feels good once you get it, but once you, before that, it's, it's a little awkward. So I would probably move a uh in that fifth section i would make a gain worker action like that would just be where you gain the workers and maybe i'd still have them cover up the produce action i think it might actually be more intuitive um than it is currently to have it that way rather than have produce tied to uh the workers covering up that space as for the bottom row you know the bottom row would probably be this is something i learned for expeditions uh, through scythe i would probably have the bottom row be how you score stars um, so instead of having it be just okay. something that you have to, that you can do at any time on your turn, when you happen to reach a, a, a scoring category, um, you would have to like boast about something like you do an expedition. So that would be the bottom of reaction. You would boast about it and maybe you could upgrade it to earn a few extra points right away or a few extra coins right away when you boast, but you would have to take an action and that would be a, maybe a clear signal to other players that you have to do this thing and it would prevent players from unexpectedly ending the game by getting like two stars on one turn because you have to take that that turn one at a time yeah i think that's a very good answer uh <laughs> I, I i agree with both parts just from having to teach people side things mm -hmm. to onboard into it it seems that um yeah. the how like because not only the 
um, like the like you said for production, not under like not explaining that. Oh, if you get too many workers, you're going to start to lose not only um, power but also uh, the what is the, the hearts? I forget what the exact the, the popularity. Are, yeah, popularity yeah. Um, yeah. are tied into that, and to just be mindful of that. But yeah. also the uh, I find it very uh, clever, and I I love seeing if I can get two stars at once to end games <laughs> when I play size. Uh -huh. I, I can acknowledge that some gamers probably find that uh, rubs them that can rub the, them the wrong way with the yeah. experience. Yeah. So the next question is uh, based around viticulture, and so yeah. if you were to change the for uh, so I guess it's in all of it, it, but the the wake up track order and the benefits that um, for those of who aren't familiar with <laughs> viticulture. Uh, it's to you, you're setting turn order for like as the round progresses, um, mm -hmm. who gets to be the first player, and the later you go in the turn order, the more benefits you get. If you right. had to replace that mechanic with a auction form mechanic, um, mm. what initial auction would you think of? Whether it's like an open, like a fixed income, closed income, blind, um, right. and for uh, I guess wh whichever one you land on, potentially quickly giving an overview of what type of auction that is uh, and mm. then what do you think would be affected um, on the board like it, what mechanical right. thematical um, parts of the game do you think that would break that would need to be initially fleshed out before like seeing if the, if the mechanic can work yeah that, that's a really interesting question um because viticulture one of the uh one of the elements of viticulture that I think is a little, it, 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 once you know it again, it, it works, but it's a little odd when you're learning it is that money isn't really all that valuable. Like you need money to build structures and you need money to, to do some other things, to use some, some visitor cards, things like that. But uh, it isn't all that valuable. So I would definitely use the, the actual money for the auction. Like well, players use the money, but I would also, for the auction, I wouldn't want it to overstay its welcome. I would want it to be fast, just like the wake-up mm -hmm. track is fast. And so it would probably be a single bid per player um, using the money somehow, but just a single bid. It, that, that's, I'd have to brainstorm that a little bit more, Sam, but that's an interesting question on how to do that. I, I think that's, uh, yeah. no, that, that's a very good thought provoker. I guess that's yeah. sort of the whole purpose behind these uh, questions is sort of the yeah. what the initial thought would be and then potentially how you test it is sort of like what thought can lead to the action and then yeah hopefully the quick failure for the next iteration or maybe it's a success but <laughs> yeah um, the last question i have for you is if tapestry were not a civ game but mm -hmm. had to have a whole new theme associated to it um you can correct me if i'm wrong but i believe you had wanted to develop a civilization style game which led to yeah. tapestry um yeah. so if you started with the mechanics of it um what hmm. theme would you instinctively try to um build around and uh i guess an insight to jamie of why why th that theme would be one that you'd want to try and make work and yeah. what would be the first part of the game that you think would need to be tested around uh the theme to see if it holds weight, whether it's the income boards or the, the city maps or um, something like that. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if I were to take an element of tapestry, a mechanism from tapestry and apply it to another game, it would probably be the tracks. I, I really like that action selection system that I'm able to essentially put 48 different actions in tapestry, but at any given time, you only have the option to choose four of them. You're advancing on a track. You're paying to advance one space on a track and you're gaining that benefit. I really like that. Um, and I kind of not I took it. I, I, I was inspired by Mombasa. Mombasa has a, a somewhat similar mechanism in Mombasa. Okay. Um, and so what theme would I apply it to? I, I, the two things that I would love to design a game around at some point are heist. I love heist fiction. I love heist movies. Um, and time travel or time loops. I love time travel, time loop fiction. And so I don't know if either of them would necessarily work for that mechanism, but those would be like, if I had to sit down with that mechanism and with a theme that I was already interested in, those are the two that I would sit down first and see if there is a way to make a heist theme work. In fact, the, the tracks could work for a heist where you're trying to 
maybe advance on a few different heists um, along the way. And time travel could kind of work, but time travel, especially if it's time loop, you'd probably be jumping around within the tracks, and that isn't really the mechanism in uh, in Tapestry, jumping around in them. So yeah, I would say a heist themed game with the Tapestry track somehow. That's, that's a very in interesting thought experiment to kind of <laughs> go into that rabbit hole of like, yeah. all right, like go through the laundry list because uh, so many of the mechanics in Tapestry are, uh, in, in my opinion, very well executed from like how um, certain tracks work together, but also the um, idea of freeing up on your income board, like placing out the income buildings and working that um, the, the city puzzle uh, almost polyomino-esque. But yeah. you had mentioned uh, sort of that time loop tra time travel, which un unlocked the the interesting uh, another interesting thought experiment is like if it was parallel dimensions, um, oh, and yeah. like each track was its own universe would be a a creative thought experiment to try and flesh out a new game for. I like that. Yeah, that's kind of it's a little bit of the theme of Fantasies of Futures, the latest expansion, but uh, not using the tracks in that way. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Same if, oh, there you, how you want to write interview up here? You the time you've given me. Um, well, I did want to ask you one thing. What you mentioned in your email, some of the 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 preparation that you are doing as you're as you're building up a towards a game design, working on game design, but also um, in fact, I have two questions for you. One, you're working on is it a podcast or YouTube channel called Game Stormy? Uh, so I'm working on a YouTube channel. The YouTube idea channel. Okay. Um, I have adapted from other content creators in the space of um, sort of my, my brainchild. There's a few of them if you find the page that are uh, very raw at this point. But uh -huh. the idea is to go live for 30 minutes once a week and go through similar to the questions that we just went through. Um, there is a website called... Uh, let's make a game.net and it has a game idea generator and it will give you uh, the genre, the rule, the setting and the theme that the game takes place. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is to go live and do a five minute brainstorm where it generates sort of those five as a prompt. And I, I am live kind of sketching and talking out the idea until the five minutes are up and okay. then recap with sort of uh, a summary of where the game's at, what the next, step would be uh, for me as a to, to protest its proof of concept. Um, okay. And then um, other things like that, um, where taking a game you really like, and then I have a one of those wheels that you spin and okay. quickly describing what the game is and what the mechanic you like most about it. Um, okay. Today's was Wingspan. Uh, uh -huh. Just as of a impromptu, it was behind me on the shelf within reaching distance. And it was, if I had to replace the tableau building with, it ended up with uh, pattern matching uh, mm -hmm. or pattern building, um, sort of the what, how you would go about that. Um, and just sort of the, I, I like the idea of these quick little bursts of a quick brainstorming um, microcosm to try and help inspire to unlock sort of that creative flow for the rest of the day. Yeah. Um, so that's sort of uh, what I, have started to doing and I'm getting more comfortable with that. So I've, I've lost the plot on what the exact question you were asking was. Oh, no, I was just, I, I wanted you to share that with people and I'll put it, uh, if you are oh, okay with me sharing a link, I'll share a link. If you can send me a link, I'll, I'll share it in the, in the description of this video. I'd be happy to. Um, and the other thing you you mentioned in your, your preparation is that you read a book called Principles by Jack Canfield. Is that right? Uh, yeah, The Principles of Success. Is it Principles and of so, Success? Okay. Um, and I, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, describe by, well, let me ask the question and then you can, you can uh, describe what the book is about. Cause I haven't read this book, but I wanted to see uh, after you share like the general concept of the book, if you can share with people watching this, what is one action that you would recommend that they take from what you learned about the book? One simple action, something, whether it's a daily thing, a weekly thing or a one-time thing. Uh, yeah. So the principles of, of success um, by Jack Canfield, I, um, so as someone that's dyslexic, uh, reading for pleasure isn't a huge thing that I occupy a lot of my time with, um, but I'm very passionate about sort of like when I do commit to um, reading through something or listening through something in the audio form, 
uh, to try and like use it for a purpose uh, that I can grow from. And so when listening to, uh, that is what book I'd credit with me um, getting out of the comfortable space that uh, a lot of people I feel like live in. Uh, I just I'll give a quick shout out to Gabe Barrett uh, talks about the, I believe it's the RP effect. He, he has a video, I can send you the link for that as well. But he yeah. talks about how some of the hardest decisions are when you're in a comfortable position to uh, take the next step out of it. Cause like when you are in a bad situation, uh, it, there's a lot more driving to like immediately jump out, but I'd credit the principles of success for sort of the, the catalyst of me continuing my forward momentum. And it was really the, in the first two chapters are um, very impactful. And the first one, it talks about your purpose statement. And then the second one, um, the workbook item that it has you do is list out 20 things that you like, that you love that bring joy for you. And so the first, the, the purpose statement um, is taking something that you're passionate about and two qualities that you admire about yourself and to write out what in a sentence to use all of that to write a statement of how to do what you love through those two qualities of your person um, to write all that out. And that is sort of your purpose statement. And that really um, made it very clear to me um, that I wasn't on a direction towards like being able to live that. And so I don't have my purpose statement up right now, but it's something that I look at once a week to remind myself to kind of recenter. Um, but in summary, my, the thing I enjoy most is seeing uh, that, hence why I kind of asked the smile question. Um, the moments that people smile at the game table um, and are like the feeling like the internet and like the all of life kind of like can subside for a little bit um while you're at the table with friends loved ones those that you care about um and those moments that create those smiles is sort of just something i gravitate to and so i believe the two personality uh traits that i listed were um i think something around perceptiveness and the um just creativity and problem solving uh okay those are what I wrote about. Uh, that's, that's the first, I would recommend anyone that's willing to kind of look inside themselves to do that. It's, I found it extremely impactful, um, but you also need to know to do it at the right time or looking inside sometimes won't work if you're not ready for it. But the second thing that's probably a little easier to do is I'd suggest to anyone list out 20 things that bring you joy. Um, the first five or six are usually easy in the mm -hmm. sense that it's like, um, you know, I really like to play board games. I really like to go to the gym. I really like good food. And once yeah. you get through some of those easier, like what your hobbies are and like what you can connect just happiness to, um, you may find that the second half of the answers are really helpful in the sense that, um, you know, whether it's, I like to see strangers smile or I like when people laugh at my jokes or like those yeah. become a little more or less, um, attached to a specific, uh, I guess, not superficial, but like, a, a, like it's, it, it unlocks more and it, it creates a really great um, thought experiment for you to like sit down and kind of look and like, both of those were very instrumental in sort of getting me to uh, feel comfortable enough to reach out to Jamie, who I've never really met before, <laughs> other than online. And um, I, I would encourage anyone to take those steps even though they sound easy, they're not um, like the easiest emotionally to sometimes do, but mm -hmm. um, are very helpful in the grand scheme of things. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. That's that's it's an exercise that I've never done myself. So I think I, I will try to do that. And I'm really curious about that. The 20 list in particular, especially like you said, that the first few might be obvious and easy and curious what those, those final 10 would look like. So I'm going to give that a try. I really appreciate you sharing that, Sam. I, I'm happy to share my... Uh, my list with you after this conversation, um, or maybe once you've let me know that you've had yours, I don't want to influence you at all. Oh, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's supposed to be a, an individual type thing, but uh, yeah. And I would, if you're comfortable with it, Jamie, I'd highly encourage you to share that with your audience because I think that yeah. um, is a very humanizing thing. If, again, it's sometimes a um, not the easiest to show the unpolished self, but that's sort of the. Yeah the habit I'm trying to build and I'd encourage all to get comfortable doing the same, even though it's not easy.
Well, thank you, Sam, for sharing that. Um, and I, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to chat about, about game design and what you're working on and, uh, and, and, and principles of success. So uh, is there anything else that you want people to know before we sign off? Um, uh, I'm going <laughs> to... I guess I, I did just submit my, like, I, I now have a blog that I'm doing something in the similar fashion to Jamie of just sort of um, try like building it to connect with others. Uh, I'd be, I'd, I'd, it's called McMeeble Publishing, um, but I, I don't want to spend too much time promoing myself. But if you wanted to link that in the bio I'd, yeah. or of the video, I'd be extremely grateful for that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Send me, we have some links that we've talked about today. I will put all of them that we remember in the, in the description below. If we forget something. <laughs> Let us know in the comments and we'll put it down there as well. I believe um, I owe you the Mike Delicio link. Um, the Gabe Barrett link. The Gabe uh, Barrett link. Game Storming and your blog. Yeah, I think those are the four. Maybe we'll, there's one more. Uh, yeah, yeah. But yeah, thank you so much. If you have any questions uh, for, for me or Sam, feel free to put them in the comments below and I'll, I'll let Sam know when the video is live so he can be available to, to check out some of those comments um, and questions. And feel free to, any of these questions that Sam has asked me today, I think he's asked some great questions. Feel free to answer them in the comments too. If you have a fun answer for anything that you are working on, I'd love to hear your answer too. All right, thank you, Sam. Take care, I hope you have a great Tuesday. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you so much for the opportunity.